I'm in the States for a month uh, on a war bond selling tour. The war may be over in Europe, but we still have the jacks to lick. <laughs> and our boys will do it, too, with your bonds and their blood. Will you be joining General MacArthur in the Pacific? Oh, I've been appointed uh, proconsul of Bavaria. But would you like to go to the Pacific? Yes, I'd love to go and fight the Japanese. <laughs> You've seen the general. Two years and seven months. Oh. Oh. When he left, he told me he thought he'd, he'd die fighting. Oh, it seems a miracle that he's back, even if it is just for a short leave. Oh. How long have you and the general been married? 35 years. Oh, General Patton, sir, could you, General Patton, sir, could you tell our readers your secret for a long and happy marriage? Well, to begin with, you have to start off with uh, marrying the right person. <laughs> now, as to what Beatrice got out of the bargain, you'll have to ask her. I think she's got cheated me. Oh, <laughs> we seem wicked somehow to cause such a wonderful girl to love such a fool. Oh. But we're shaped and fashioned by what we love, and in that condition, I've always been a very, very lucky man. Uh, Mrs. Patton, does the general park in his sleep? No. <laughs> But if he ever does, I'll give him my undivided attention. <laughs> Mrs. Patton. Yes. As the wife of a famous general who is frequently in the headlines for being outspoken, do you have anything to say to the American press? Now, be careful not to. <laughs> well, I respect all that is fair and courageous in the press. I would only ask you to understand that my husband is a tough perfectionist. <clears throat> well, General, would you give us a statement? Well, gentlemen, I'm a soldier first and last. I'm not a politician, not a diplomat, not a statesman, and I make no alibis for the things that I say. <laughs> now, if you'll forgive me, my family and I are leaving for California. I want to pay a visit to my boyhood church in San Gabriel and give thanks to God before I go back to Germany. Uh, <laughs>
charge him. What's the Commandant? Let that Colonel through. This is the famous SS, the elite of the German army. Yes, you understand me. Pull yourself together, Colonel. The appearance of you and your men is a disgrace. You look like a bunch of vagrants at a convention of traps. Now, by tomorrow, I want you cleaned up and ready for inspection. We're gonna have a little spit and polish around here. You're gonna be ashamed of yourself. You're standing? For what? For work. We have no advisories authorizing their use. What the hell with the advisories? We need wood cut. Every family should have enough wood to heat at least one room throughout the winter. But the POW is cutting. We've got a big job here. Feeding and housing displaced Germans. Getting a decent government going. And it's not going to be easy. Keeping the peace is a battle, too. When war is over, you just don't sit back on your fannies and stop fighting. War and peace are two sides of the same coin. You've got to be prepared to squash the next little wallpaper hanger that comes along. That's why most people don't seem to understand about preparedness. They think that we've vanquished the last tyrant on Earth. <laughs> well, they're wrong. Every generation breeds new ones. In time of peace, prepare for war. Those aren't my words, gentlemen. Those are the words of General George Washington. Thank you. Carry on. Gentlemen, I'd like to introduce General Patton. Be seated, please, General. As you know, I've been appointed military governor of Bavaria. That means that I am responsible for the welfare of the entire civilian population. And we have a lot of problems here. Food, clothing, medicine, fuel, in short, survival. In my estimation, this issue takes precedent over purging local governments of minor officials who have been accused, without proof, of paying lip service to the Nazi party. Now, you people are here today because you are the men who run Bavaria. You know how to get the job done. All I can say about that is that whatever your past affiliations, if you do them well, 
you will keep your jobs. Which of you is Minister President Schaefer? I am, General. Dr. Schaefer, there are those in the American government who believe that the German economy should be broken. Needless to say, I'm not one of them. But I want you and your cabinet to put Bavaria on its feet before winter. If it is not, you will answer to me. Yes, General. Thank you, gentlemen. That's all. This is civilian hospitals, uh, this is fuel availability, this is water supply, here's railroads, this one's electric power. These require signatures. Clear. Oh, and uh, this is the redeployment policy. That'll be all. Thank you, Lieutenant. Sorry, sir. It's General Bedell Smith on the phone. That's what I was afraid of. Yes, Bedell. Well, I'm carrying out Ike's orders as fast as I can. I don't care about the professor's report. Yes, I'm ready. My concern here is to get enough wood to keep people from freezing to death this winter, not to kick out every little file clerk who said Heil Hitler. Yeah. Uh, Beetle, it took me 40 weeks to conquer this part of Germany. Now, it's going to take a reasonable amount of time to replace all the officials who were Nazis. You, you can't do it overnight, huh? even if it means turning the local government into a shambles? Yeah, well, I'll keep that in mind. all units. With reference to the promotion system, I see no reason why. Excuse me, Alex. Georgie, what can I do for you? Nothing. I just want to get rid of these lousy cigars. I'm going to stop smoking them. Oh, good. You can have them. Where was I? With reference to the promotion system, I see no reason. I see no... George. George, are you okay? Sure, I'm fine. I suppose you heard that my transfer to the Pacific is out. Ah, uh, you just might still go to China. I doubt it. Unless Doug MacArthur steps on a landmine. <laughs> Let's face it, he's the one who's pulling the strings. He just doesn't want the competition. Mm -hmm, yeah. Two prima donnas is one too many. <laughs> now I got Beetle Smith on my back. Apparently he speaks for Ike nowadays. According to the Beetle, Ike is unhappy with my uh, efforts at denazifying this place. He wants a clean sweep now. Everyone with any Nazi affiliation is out on his butt. That means I'm supposed to fire the entire Schaefer cabinet and refill it with displaced Jews and communists who don't know anything about running the country. Well, the hell with it. Every civil servant in Germany paid homage to the party. If he didn't, he was out of a job. Oh, I think it's stupid. I'm going to drag my feet as long as I can. Watch out for Beetle. 
He's Ike's official hatchet man. <laughs> He's some bitch is what he is. <laughs> General Eisenhower, General Smith has arrived. It's about time. Send him in. Yes, sir. You may go in, General. Thank you. You're late. Sorry, I... Okay, let's have it. Is he gonna follow my directive or not? He says he needs more time. More time. An order is an order. What's the American army doing in Germany if not to rid the administration of Nazis? George calls them ex-Nazis. Bull! They're Nazis in my book. How many of them does George have in key positions? Schaefer's the main one, and there are 20 under him. 20? He's also got a whole entourage of Nazis on his household staff. You know, Ike, it seems to me that with the chief of staff job coming up in Washington, when did this could become a stumbling block to your appointment? Uh, it all reflects back on you, you know. I should have sent George home after he slapped that soldier in Sicily. We believe that two in his household are with the Nazi Secret Service, which is still operating. I'm going to go talk with him. Have this out. I'll fly to Munich tomorrow. You want to come? No, I better not. George hates my guts. You going to ride in this morning, General? Uh, yes. What'd you like for breakfast, sir? Oh, just orange juice. How long you been with me, George? About a year, sir. And what do I always have for breakfast? Just orange juice. Anything else? No, sir. And why in hell do you ask me every morning what I want for breakfast? Morning I don't ask. Morning you ask for ham and eggs. These are magnificent animals. Well, they come from uh, France. How did you come by them? Well, Baron, you might say the Third Army liberated them. I see. Sad. Almost every boy in America knows how to run a car, but very few of them understand anything about horses. I suppose they think that horses run on gasoline. Yes. I guess if you have to govern Bavaria, this is a good place to do it from. You know, uh, I have no animosity towards professional soldiers like yourself who fought against me. I'm grateful to hear that, General. Yeah, well, I, I enjoy our talks. It's been a revelation to meet an American general who is informed about the communist aim in Europe. <laughs> I'm informed, all right. Trouble is, most of my rubber-legged colleagues are scared to death of offending the Bolsheviks. They think that treaties and votes keep the wolf at bay. The fatherland must be saved. Germany will need a champion. I've done everything I can. There's never been a better chance of producing a war as we have in Europe right now. The German troops I'm holding, and my own men, I could push the Russians all the way back to Moscow.
Georgie. <laughs> you old horse thing. <laughs> Come on. Uh, what's new down at Shafe? Oh, things are going very well. I've gotten reports that conditions in certain DP camps are deteriorating. So I decided to come see for myself. And since this happened to be on the way, well, I guess I just wanted to see you. <laughs> well, you know I'm always glad to see you. Georgie, how long have we known each other? 20, 25 years. Let's see, Camp Cold, Pennsylvania, 1918. My God, how young we were. <laughs> Starting off into the unknown. <laughs> You're my oldest friend. I remember once you told me you thought your life and mine were under the protection of some supreme fate. I didn't know that my life would largely depend on you. You could easily have forgotten me after that uh, incident in Sicily. But you gave me Third Army instead. I claim an almost proprietary interest in you, Georgie. <laughs> I have. I have taken a lot of stands for you. I know you have. I'm grateful. But friendship is one thing, and our professional relationship is another. As you know, I've announced a firm policy for denazifying local administrations. Even if they fall apart? Yes, but they won't. That's debatable. Not anymore. The debatable stage of the question, long past. Any opposition to the faithful execution of my order will not be regarded leniently by me, friend or no friend. Yes, sir. General, do you think the denazification program can be carried out by commanders who are temperamentally and emotionally in disagreement with it? I don't think we have anyone like that. Oh? Well, what about General Patton? Now, isn't he opposed? No. General Smith, are you familiar with General Patton's most recent statement on Saturday? I'm not prepared to discuss that now. Well, he said, and I quote, it is no more possible for a man to have been a civil servant in Germany and not have paid lip service to Nazism than it is for a man to be a postmaster in America and not have paid lip service to the Democratic or Republican parties when in power. Do you agree with General Patton's analogy? Miss McNulty, uh, I'm sure General Patton didn't mean to equate the Republican Party with the Nazi Party. <laughs> Those are his own words. He also said, that he personally never saw any necessity to denazify, since 98% of the Nazis were pushed into it anyway. General Patton is a soldier and will carry out his orders. General Smith. Uh, General, General Smith, General, Smith. General, is it true that former Nazis are still holding office in Bavaria? As I said, General Patton will carry out his orders. So, Perseus, it's funktioniert. Ausgezeichnet. Uh, this canal in operation, General. Transport between Munich and the southern cities will be facilitated. Barges with food and fuel will supply hundreds of thousands in need.
out there, General. And we will have two more canals fully repaired before winter. Good work, Doctor. Congratulate your people for me. Whatever their sentiments a year ago, they know how to get the work done. <laughs> the Russians would have taken two years to repair the locks. Then they would have had the water running the wrong way. <laughs> Very good, General. <laughs> That's high praise coming from you. What did you learn the skills? <laughs> Baron, I'm an old saber-rattling cameraman from way back. Uh, no wonder. Eh? Good, George. Yeah, well, the Baron's got a wicked attack. <laughs> uh, bad you're not one of them pink old journalists we had over here on Saturday. But without the padded vest. More problems with the press, General? Yes, the ragtag, bobtail remnants of the great U.S. press. Huh? I don't get it. I used to have them on my side. Didn't I have them? Always. Now they try to provoke me, put words in my mouth. They certainly did Saturday. I lost my temper. I should have known better. What's that? For Mike. Stick it right there. <laughs> so the Nazis are just like Republicans and Democrats, George. They twisted my words. I was trying to make a point. Well, you made it all right. To the New York Times, you've created a major scandal. I withdrew the remark. Well, that'll do a lot of good now. Sit down. George, the war was about Nazis. And for you to say they were just another political party. That isn't what I meant. These SS troops you're holding. What about them? You've got them drilling like they're going into combat tomorrow. Well, they look like bombs. I'm trying to give them back their self-respect. SS units don't need self-respect. We don't want them to have self-respect. Now, I don't believe this, but I've been told that you'd like nothing better than to provoke a showdown with the Russians and combine those SS troops with your third army. That's crazy. Crazy is right, but is it true? No, sir, it is not. I have to admit, I wouldn't mind having a crack at those Mongols. The Mongols, those Russians are our allies. I've said this to you a hundred times, and you persist in these hostile statements. I disagree with you, that's all. You can't disagree with me. It's not a matter of, of, of opinion. It's a matter of policy. You will carry out my policy, yes, sir. Now, about the Schaefer situation. Uh, that's under investigation. I appointed you administrator of Bavaria. And you retained a minister president who employs 20 Nazis in his cabinet. 20. Where did you get that information? Dorn. Professor Walter Dorn. He's our expert on denazification. Probably a communist in disguise. I checked this out myself. This Schaefer has 16 Nazi friends in agriculture and four in finance. All cases for mandatory removal under my instructions. I can't disrupt the administration of Bavaria over some vague accusations. My Anglo-Saxon ancestry makes me reluctant to remove people without due process of law. Due process? However, I will carry out your wishes to the letter. And in spirit spirit. How about this Bungenheim you ride with? Fine horseman. Won a gold medal in the 36 Olympics. He was a colonel in the SS. So I understand. And that's all you understand? Look, I, I realize that sometimes I am a political embarrassment to you. But Bavaria is running like a clock. I've got that place moving. We're rebuilding and we're going to be on our feet before any other part of Germany. But 
it is an embarrassment to you? It's causing you problems about getting into the White House? What did you say? I think you'd make a great president. Oh, don't give me that crap! I can't pay for you myself! No. Shut up, George! And listen! If you think that what I've said is motivated by personal interest, you're badly mistaken. And you're impugning my honor. There's nothing dishonorable about seeking political office. It's your mouth, George. You can't control it. You never could. And I'll tell you something else. It's getting so bad that people think there's something wrong with you. Now, I admire your good qualities, but I've got to face facts. You're just no military governor. I believe it would be in your best interests if you gave up command of the Third Army. You're relieving me? I'm transferring him. General Giraud is going home. I'm giving you command of the 15th Army in Bad Nauheim. The 15th? It's a paper army. They're running the history of the war. That's no army. They never fired a shot. No one has to fire any more shots, George. That's something you've got to understand. The war is over. I admire you, your audacity, your ability. But those very qualities that made you great in wartime are a pain in the neck in peacetime. If you're planning on spending the night, of course you're welcome to stay with me, but I imagine you'd rather get home as soon as possible. Yeah. I'll leave now. Don't take too long. Hmm? I won't. I'll join you in three days. You know, I'm going to kind of uh, miss this place. You'll get over it. I always have. I had the same sort of sentimental attachment to the Seventh Army as I have to the Third. But I got over it.
16th Army. Teen hut! At ease as you were. Well, George, this is it. Reports from theater commanders, staff reports, analytical studies on tactics. More comes in every day. I'd like to review the troops. I'm afraid you just did. Looks like a paper army, all right. That's what it is. Well, Paul, you better lay in a supply of the most essential piece of equipment we're going to need. What's that, George? Eye drops. <laughs> My darling B. It seems I've been kicked upstairs to the 15th Army. They sneaked me to my new command like a thief in the night. It's one hell of a way for Ike to treat me. But things will change, and I'll be way out in front again. This so-called army is just a handful of clerks and a committee of officers whose job is to write a lot of stuff that no one will ever read. Well, what do you think of the 15th Army? Well, I think it's going to be fine, sir. Except slow. Dangerous. Dangerous? Yes, sir. One of the cooks told me, uh, two clerks got buried under a ton of paper the other day. Took, uh, six hours to dig them out. The bodies were covered in ink. Smudged to death. That's it, sir. <laughs> Go on to bed. Yes, sir. <coughs> Good night, gentlemen. Good night, George. forward to Christmas with you. Officially, I'm calling it a 30-day leave, but it'll be for good. I don't intend to come back to Europe unless it's to fight in the next war. I'm getting out, B. I just want to look into your brave, loyal eyes again. My conscience is clear, B. If a man's done his best, what more is there? General? General Patton. Good evening, General. Stay, really. Welcome to the Grand Hotel, General. Colonel Harkins has asked that I conduct you to him. Uh, if you'll please follow me. Ah, uh, this won't take too long, Woody. Just a quick drink with Colonel Harkins. In fact, the damn paperwork. Yes, uh, better give uh, Willie a walk. Yes, sir. <laughs> I know I'm right in what I did, and the rest can go to hell. Or I hope they can, because it's going to be pretty crowded down there. At the moment, I feel mad. My public position is that Ike has done me a favor by giving me this new assignment. But my private opinion is that practically everyone but myself is a pusillanimous son of a bitch. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Chickory chick to la cha la, check a la me in a banana cabalica wallak again. You see, chickory chick is me. Chickory chick to la cha la, check a la me in a banana cabalica wallak again. You see, chickory chick is me. Every time you spread in the heart, it's the same. I swear. You take Doug McCarthy, huh? He's got a crack. Mark Clark. He's got a weak chin. Besides, he gives me the creeps. <laughs> now, Ike's face is 
bland. <laughs> Omar, the tent maker, he's got a very strong jaw. You know, it makes a good impression the first time around until you realize how really mediocre. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then Monty, we have Monty. Monty has the expression of a ferocious rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> and then we come down to Beetle Smith. The only problem with Beetle's face is it shows. <laughs> gentlemen, gentlemen, please. Ladies, have your attention, please. Thank you. Six months ago, we were still fighting a war with Nazi Germany. A war to liberate Europe from the oppression of the Third Reich. The armed forces of the USA and her allies won that war. A large measure of credit for that achievement goes to a man whose hell-raising leadership galvanized his men to victory in Africa, Sicily, France, and Germany. The exploits of the Third Army made history because of an extraordinary general whose men would follow him would any of you gentlemen care to test it? Would it kill me if I ran my hand through it, sir? I invite you to try it, Johnson. At your own risk. Patton. How about you? Yes, sir. him for being a rip-roaring soldier and a warm-hearted friend. So, so, this toast to General George S. Patton. Happy birthday and long life. God bless you. Happy birthday. Reassuring to know that I'm still a fairly good-sized social lion. <laughs> I, I thank you, Paul, Jeff, everyone. I don't have uh, very much to say, except you know that the most difficult thing for a general to do is to make up his mind. And then, of course, to withstand the gruesome rumors that are thrust upon him by less stout-hearted people. Now, I've, I've been in a lot of trouble lately with the press and uh, some of my colleagues, most of whom are supposed to be my friends. <laughs> I guess it's my own fault, but uh, it, it reminds me of a young woman friend of mine who had a baby recently, and uh, she said, oh, it's so wonderful to be able to roll over and uh, lie on my uh, tummy again. I said, my dear child, uh, had you uh, maintained that position originally, you probably would not be in your <laughs> recent unenviable condition. <laughs> I, I, I thank you. I thank you for your toast and your praise. And I uh, would like to say that uh, George S. Patton was simply a hook upon which to hang the Third Army. And I can tell you this, the Third Army is the best thing that has ever happened to George S. Patton. George S. Patton was the best thing that ever happened to the whole damn army. Well, I am 60 years old today. Last time a war ended, I uh, wrote a poem for my wife, uh, Beatrice. I don't feel quite up to it now, but I would like to say one or two lines from my favorite poet, uh, Rudyard Kipling. Uh, two things greater than all things are. The first is love, 
and the second war. And since we know not how war may prove, heart of my heart, let us talk of love. <laughs> He's not European, but Asiatic. Therefore, he thinks deviously. We can no more understand those Mongol savages than we can understand Chinamen or Japs. In my opinion, the Bolshevik is a congenital liar, barbarian, and a chronic drunk. It'd be fun to kill a few of them. <laughs> Am I missing out on something here? Uh, sit down, Jeff. Pull up a chair. You remember my wife's niece, uh, Jean Gordon? Of course. Hello. Your keys just took over my old outfit at the 7th Army in Heidelberg. Well, it's good to see you again, General. Paul, I thank you. Went to a lot of trouble to arrange this party. My pleasure, George. I just wish Beatrice could have been. Well, B's probably mapping out my holiday leave. If I know B, you won't have a free minute. <laughs> Did you care to dance? Yes. Silly. He's probably thinking what a lucky old fool I am. That perfume. It's over, isn't it? <laughs> the war, yes. You know what I mean. Yes, it's over. General Big Wig. Wow. I have a confession to make. I wanted the war to go on just a little longer. Isn't that incredible? I'm so ashamed. Could anyone be so selfish? I'd be so lonely without you. Why does everything come too late? The hair turns gray and love looks out of an old man's eyes. It's not what I mean. It is beautiful, though. Who wrote it? Gates? No. I don't know. Browning. <laughs> Who is then? Bigwig. You're a remarkable poet, General Bigwig. And to Mooka. Sure. <laughs> Your West Point French has improved, Lieutenant Patton. No wonder. I was 107th in a class of 123. Ooh, that's uh, 16 from the bottom. <laughs> Obviously, I didn't marry you for your prowess in languages. <laughs> for what, then? Oh, you're fishing for compliments again, Lieutenant. You know, Mrs. Patton, you really are rather pretty for a retired debutante. <laughs> I couldn't sleep last night. 
Want to know why? No. What? I couldn't either. Why? I was thinking about us. What it would be like being married. Being alone together at last. From Piccadilly, she is the blackout queen. Lily from Piccadilly, ugliest girl I've seen. <laughs> the searchlights moving overhead till Messer Schmidt's are gone. Don't take her gas mask off; she looks much better with it on. Yeah. <laughs> from Piccadilly, she is the blackout queen. Come on, everybody, sing it. It's should never bother you. She's several missing parts. <laughs> One glass eye, wooden leg. She's still the queen of tarts. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Lily, from Piccadilly. <laughs> she is the blackout queen. Good, good, very good. It's Lily from Piccadilly. She is the blackout queen. Lily <laughs> from Piccadilly. Ugliest girl I've seen. Who cares if she has pigeon toes? A voice that's rather harsh. <laughs> She's one good trait, an RAF type handlebar mustache. <laughs> From Piccadilly, queen of the blackout, laser rubber knockout. She won't let you back out. You won't pay a stack out for Lily. The Black Out Private First Class Woodring here. Over. This is Sergeant Mix. Wake up, Private. General Patton, General Gay, going pheasant hunting south of Mannheim. You driving. Over. But he's going back to the States tomorrow. He's going hunting today. Like when? Like in 20 minutes. The General wants to use the limo. Joe Spruce will follow in the truck with the guns and dog. Over. What time is it, anyway? Last night with that big blonde foil Why not tell the whole world about it? Oh, don't worry. If they catch you fraternizing again, what more can they do to you? You've already been demoted to the bottom of the heap. 
Come on, it's half past seven. When are we leaving? Whenever they want. Now, you got the guns? Yeah, yeah, they're in the back. Hey, uh, do you think she could get me a crowd girlfriend? I'm getting really lonely. Yeah, I'll bet. I swear. <laughs> thing I've ever seen. He's going to be a real scrapper, I thought. I'm going to name him after William the Conqueror. <laughs> He's the biggest coward in dogdom. <laughs> Maybe I should have slapped him. Very funny. <laughs> well, well, what are we going to do? Oh, all right, you be a good boy while Daddy's gone. Morning, Woody. Morning, sir. Morning, Woody. Uh, Spruce got the directions? Yes, sir. I told him to just follow us. We'll just keep him in sight. I, I won't mind losing Spruce. It's Engelbert I'm worried about. in Belgium last month. Woody got me back to Bad Nauheim in less than two hours. 70 miles an hour through all the checkpoints. You should have seen him scurry. Didn't Woody used to be a sergeant? Oh, yeah. But he's devoted to the local ladies. Woody is constantly in love. Life's unfair. So many lines and no fraternization allowed. That's a stupid idea. You can't control sex. All that moralistic garbage. We both know that when morals go down, morale goes up a heck of a problem. But apparently one that Woody enjoys wrestling with. <laughs> Sergeant says to the private, he said, well, son, what would you like to learn in this man's army? And he... The recruit says, I'd, I'd like to learn to drive a tank, sir. He said, well, in that case, I won't stand in your way. <laughs> well, you'd think if my chief of staff won't laugh at my jokes, at least my driver would. Oh, sorry, sir. It was uh, really funny. It's just that I've heard it a few times before. Well, not for me, you haven't. I haven't even thought of that joke in years. I, I haven't told it since I can't remember when. I'll tell you one thing, though. I'll bet when I did tell it the last time, I probably brought the house down. So the sergeant says, tell me, Private, what do you want to learn in this man's army? And the recruit says, I want to learn how to drive a tank, sir. Well, says the sergeant, in that case, Private, I won't stand in your way. <laughs> <coughs> This model is a revolutionary design. Yeah, it's revolutionary, all right. Damn contraption. Now, I ask that you gentlemen use your imagination, for as you can see, this experimental model has very little armor plating yet and no superstructure. For our purposes, though, it will demonstrate what you gentlemen from the War Department need to see in order to make your evaluation and recommendation to the Ordnance Department. This new model can break through buildings, push trees over, and plow through sand at 30 miles an hour. I mean, this little iron buggy is so easy to handle. Even a child could drive it. I've got an idea. Now, how about one of you gentlemen taking it for the trial run? Huh? How about it? <coughs> now, gentlemen, there is no need for stage fright. How about a run around the field? I mean, wouldn't someone like to take the first ride? All right. B, you demonstrated for the gentleman. Of course, darling.
You see how easy it is to handle, gentlemen? Now, who'd like to give it a try? Thank you, Colonel Patton. We, uh, I think we've seen enough, and you'll be hearing from us in time. Gentlemen. Thank you. They were horrid, the pops, old fogies. They aren't important. But your presentation, they tried to make a... Forget them. Thank you, my dearest. That guy must be crazy. He is crazy. So you two just sail right through the checkpoints, huh? Not like the rest of us peasants. Can't the idiot see the four stars in this tub? How would he? He's only doing his job. Look at him shiver. Would you like to trade places with him? <laughs> From the way he carries on, you never know he's just a PFC. <laughs> Says he wants to see your identification, sir. Says it's regulations. Well, he's right. It is regulations. Well, Hap, we've run into a young man who is not impressed with old blood and guts. What am I going to do with him? Charm him, Georgie. <laughs> Morning, young man. Hello, sir. I'm General George S. Patton, commanding the 15th Army at Bad Nahai. I understand that uh, you want to see my identification. Yes, sir. That is, if you don't mind. All right. Here we are. Thank you, sir. You may pass. What's your name? Corporal Philip Leach, sir. Philip. Hmm? Good name. Strong name. Like strong names. Means you're a lover of horses. Do you like horses, Philip? Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> well, Phil, I'm going to see that your uh, CO finds out just what a good MP you make. Oh, really? Thank you, sir. <laughs> Spruce! Yes, sir. Bring Engelbert up here. Put him in the front seat. One thing will freeze to death in that damn truck. They say a reasonable number of fleas is good for a dog. Keeps him from brooding over being a dog. <laughs> and he's sure a lot better off than some of the poor devils scratching around here. Hmm? I don't understand it, Hep. All I wanted to do was help build a new Germany. All this ballyhoo of a denazification. I know, but face it, Georgie. You were Ike's champion and runner. And when you didn't follow his directives, he took you out of the game. It's as simple as that. He calls the plays. 
Well, it all boils down to one thing. Ike is bitten by the presidential bug, and he doesn't want me rocking the boat. But he will never be president. I'm telling you that right now. Trouble is, I'm an anachronism in peacetime. I never was very good at political bootlicking. Now, with FDR gone, new gang in Washington hates my guts, and they go and drop a bomb and end the Pacific War. <laughs> Probably make people like me obsolete. I don't know. I feel myself driven toward an end I cannot see. But I know as soon as I reach it, as soon as I become unnecessary, an atom will suffice to shatter me. Georgie, that doesn't sound like you. Because Napoleon said it. Oh, good. Well, I'm going home tomorrow and retire with my scrapbooks. Write a book. You always wanted to. With the story you have to tell, it'll be the greatest book to come out of World War II. Mm, maybe. But to spill the beans on people like the Beatle, uh, I, I'd hate to do it. You'd love to do it. I'd love to do it. <laughs> of course, I will continue to wear my Eisenhower jacket so that everyone can kiss my backside. <laughs> it is not I who have lost the Athenians, but the Athenians who have lost me. Sure left him a mess to clean up. Not a living thing, not even a chicken. Am I getting soft? I did most of it. Heroes like me. Uh, trains do something to me. Make me sad. Wandering forever at the earth again. You ever read of time in the river? No. We hurtle onward in the darkness. Down a million roads. When Papa died, I was too late for the funeral. For an hour, I stood there, and I realized that the grave no more held Papa than did one of his discarded suits still hanging in the closet. Suddenly, I seemed to see him in the road, wearing his checked overcoat and waving his stick, as he used to do when he was impatient with me. I salute not you, Papa. This last resting place of the beautiful body I have loved. Your soul is with me. And but for the density of my eyes, I could see you and talk with you. Oh, darling, Papa. <laughs> I stopped calling you that when I grew up. But you were. And are. My darling. I never did much for you. And you did everything for me.
drank so much beer last night, my gut feels like a beer barrel. <laughs> yeah, it looks yeah. like one too, Dexter. <laughs> uh, uh. Melvin, you got the hiccups. No. <laughs> <laughs> you guys know what hiccups are? No, what? Messages from departed spirits. <laughs> European theater. It's gonna be old blood and guts. The old man himself. Fingers for me, will you have? Sure. Here. <laughs> oh, that stupid idiotic things to happen. Damn it all, pal. Go ahead, half work my fingers. Lieutenant, you better take charge. I don't think we should move the general. Yes, sir. I'll get an ambulance. I'll be right back. Supposed to ship home. Isn't that ironic? General, I'm Dr. Snyder. Captain. I think I'm paralyzed. You're a good driver. Is Engelbert all right? Yes, sir. He's fine. You take care of him for me, will you? Yes, sir. And Willie, too. Yes, sir. Woody. Yes, sir. Take care of yourself. God bless you, sir. Lieutenant, are you all right? Uh, 
I have to get back on the horse. I've got to finish the race. Samples. Good. Then transfusions, plaza in both arms. Get the cyanotic. Get the suture tray. Use the wooden horses, shock position, no jarring. And Bertha, keep them on the litter for the time being. I don't want to jostle them around. How are the reflexes? Not getting anything. There's no evidence of fracture, though. Warren, you better get the portable x-ray machine. We can't take them up there. Okay, but I'll need some help. That thing weighs about 600 pounds. Bertha, cut away his clothes immediately. Yes, sir. Don't remove the portions underneath them. Damn. Where's the general? I was just thinking. Hell of a way to start a vacation. Now, now General, stop fussing. Watch out for those scissors, that's all. May not have much feeling down there now, but don't worry, General. Brother's been doing this for years, not a casualty yet. Cut away. Handsome revolvers, General. I rehandled. Try it. I made as many as 15 successive bullseyes. Well, I'll keep them in the strong box. There, General. Diastolic pressure is improving, Doctor. Good. Transfusion's running okay? Yes, sir. And the pulse is steadying now. Colonel Ball, please report to emergency. Colonel Ball, please report to emergency. Color's coming back to normal. No sign of hematoma in the temple region. Good. One hundred and ten over seventy-six. Good. Pulse? A regular 60. It was 45 and soft when he came in. Congratulations, General. You're doing just fine. This hurt? No. Well, General, you seem to be in good form. I'm Colonel Ball. In good form, maybe. Definitely not good shape, Colonel. General, there's no sensation near down, but we're X-raying shortly. But General, can you move your arms, your legs at all? Try again, General. All I want is for you to patch me up and get me out of here. My wife's expecting me home. See that? We noted that. It's the one reflex he has whenever he coughs. Dude, there's no doubt in your minds that I'm going to be paralyzed for the rest of my life. Let's cut out all this crap right now. Let me die. This is the main present. I think you'll like it. Well, I hope so. You know, your father hates presents. <laughs> but the salesman said it's the most practical hunting jacket they have. <laughs> Don't worry, Mother. You'll love it. Oh, I hope so. Ruth Allen, would you get the phone, please? Uh -huh. Hello? Oh, hello, Fred. Yes, she is. Just a moment. It's Uncle Fred. How are you? What? 
When? How, how serious is it? Yes, of course. Uh, call, call me back as soon as you know. I'll, I'll be here. Your, your, your father's been in an automobile accident. He's in a hospital in Heidelberg. Mother. How bad is it? They don't know. But I've got to go right away. Do you want me to go with you? No. No, no, dear. Mother. He's been in bad shape before. It's going to be all right. Yes, of course he is. Now, General, uh, when did you last urinate? When was it? Uh, 10 a.m. I can't remember. Who, who keeps a log on that? Where'd you get all these scars, General? Take a look at this, Colonel. So when was the battle? Sorry to disappoint you, gentlemen. But my only battle scar is that wound on my rump. That in 1918. It's a hell of a place for a soldier to get shot, I can tell you that. <laughs> Truth of the matter is, I turned around to see that my men were following me. <laughs> we believe you, General. You better believe me. <laughs> Most of the others are from football or riding horses. I've broken my nose, both ankles, both legs, all kinds of ribs. Gashes, cuts, scrapes, you name it. Been kicked in the head by horses more times than I can remember. You think it shows? <laughs> <laughs> Some people think it shows. Colonel, Father White is here to see the general. Hello, Father. Afternoon, Colonel. Lieutenant, how are you? Just fine, Father. Father White's here, General. Are you a Catholic? What difference does that make? In my condition, I can use all the help I can get. Come on in, Padre. Just keep it brief and to the point. Hmm? Trouble is, most preachers, when there's nothing more to be said, they're still saying it. Very good, General. My name's Major Morgan. I'm PRO at this hospital. Major, what's the word on General Patton? Not good, I'm afraid, sir. The General's in serious condition, an emergency. May I see him? Will the General wait here? I'll see what can be done. Very well, Major. Exaudivit Dominus, deprecationem meum. Dominus orationem meum, susapit. Amen. Thank you, Father. I don't know what you said, but you sure did me some good. Colonel, it's the Protestant chaplain to see the general. Yeah, send him in. Another one more or less won't hurt. Let him go to work on me. We have the x-rays, sir. Unstable fracture dislocation. No, I'm sorry, sir. I can't tell you anything about the general's condition. You'll just have to wait until Major Morgan comes in. Okay. Gentlemen, please. Now, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Major Morgan. I'm the public relations officer in this hospital. Well, what's going Major on, Major? What's the story on General Patton? I have only one thing to say. There'll be no medical bulletins issued today. Oh, oh, it is far too early for the exact nature of the injuries suffered by General Patton to be known. Is it true that he's paralyzed? Will he live? Thank you, thank you. That's all I have to say today. Over there, Pat. Come on, I'll get some coffee. You want anything to 
the weed? No. Black? Yeah. Some new sounds have all gone home for the night. Yeah. They'll be back in force tomorrow. Yeah, well, don't worry. I think tomorrow I'll authorize Colonel Ball to bar the press from the hospital altogether. They're one big nuisance. You better get some sleep. You look awful. To lead armies through two world wars. And then to have this happen. It's crazy. <laughs> Falling off a car seat and breaking your neck. Georgie's gonna have the best there is happen. One neurosurgeon's coming from the States and one from Oxford. He's got to live, Jeff. He's got to write a book. Only this morning we were talking about him writing a book. His memoirs could be the most important book of the times. Exactly. What's his condition, Jeff? His true condition. They don't tell me anything. Colonel Hill's diagnosis supported by x-rays. Spinal column behind the neck fractured at third and fourth vertebrae. Patient breathing with only one side of diaphragm. Bladder and bowels paralyzed. All sensation below the neck absent. Crutchfield tongs have been fastened in the skull to provide traction to the spinal column. My name is Kerwin, Lieutenant Colonel Walter Kerwin. I'm serving as temporary aide to Mrs. Patton. She's been waiting for two hours, and Colonel Sperling hasn't arrived yet. I think he's coming on a C-47 from Kentucky. Uh -huh. If you find out anything, call me back. Mrs. Patton. Yes. I'm Colonel Sperling. I've just arrived. Sorry to be so late. Thank you for coming, Colonel Sperling. I know you've had to change your plans. Mrs. Patton, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else but here. Thank you. Now, what do you say we go to Germany and see that husband of yours? That is an excellent idea. Well, Miss Gordon, normally I'd say no. It's against hospital regulations. But uh, you are a family. Thank you, Colonel. Now, your uncle's in here. He's sleeping last time I looked in. Colonel Hill prefers that he not be disturbed. Of course. I just want to be with him for a moment. I promise not to wake him. Well, maybe you can come back again tomorrow. Why don't you call me? It'll be a full day for him, though. No, I won't be back. And please, Colonel, don't tell him I was here.
Georgie. It's not over for me. It never will be over. General. Good morning, Carl. Sir, I have something here that I'm sure will please you. Dear General Patton, I am distressed at the painful accident which you have suffered and want you to know that I am thinking of you at this time. You have won many a tough fight, and I know that faith and courage will not fail you in this one. I am thankful that Mrs. Patton will soon be at your side to strengthen and sustain you. With prayerful wishes for your recovery, Commander-in-Chief, former Captain Harry S. Trump. It's funny, isn't it? Men become vice presidents who were never intended by party or God to be president. Yet, I think you'll do a good job. I would like you to thank those four soldiers who shared their blood with me. Will you be sure to do that for me, please? Yes, I will. Right. I'll check back later. That fragrance. You notice it, Carl? It's like perfume. Sleep. This is one patient I don't want to be late for. If you want, you can sign out. Really? Oh, thanks. I'm so nervous. How is he? Oh, he woke up at five and talked my leg off. Oh, be sure and check the tongs. They refuse to stay in place. Okay. Colonel Hill, discuss the case with you? Yes. Good. Now, I had to get him sedation, and even then he was awake a lot. Oh, and he hates the IV bottles being inside. He counts those drops like they were sheep. A neurosurgeon from Oxford is flying in this morning with his assistant. But there's one coming from the States. They're not taking any chances. Bertha, is the general, uh, well, you know, difficult? He's a doll. Don't worry. You'll like him. He's rough and sort of cute. Well, I guess I'm ready to beard the lion in his den. Might as well get it over with. They say he likes pretty women. Oh? Yeah, he's gonna love you. General. I feel much better today. I can move the index finger on my right hand. Look. Oh, that's wonderful. Let me see. Well, go ahead. Well, 
I think so. I do see a slight movement. Yes. I'm sorry, sir, but I don't know. Oh, look, honey, all we want is some simple facts. He's paralyzed, right? Well, that's what the rumor is. So how much paralyzed? Completely. Partially? The first bulletins will be issued this afternoon detailing his progress, and twice daily thereafter. How do we get through to this day? Oh, yes, of course, General Keyes. <laughs> Come in. Well, we do that right away. Well, thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Colonel, get well messages from everywhere. They're swamping us. Here's one from Lady Duff Cooper. Yes. Now, listen to this. You will conquer this battle as brilliantly and courageously as you have all the others. Winston Churchill. Well, that should boost the general's morale. Anyway, forget that just for a moment, Nancy. Take this down. Hmm? Yes, sir. And get it to the staff immediately. Won't help you people very much in communication center, but it will make everybody else's job just a bit easier. By order, General Commanding 7th Army. Press and radio reporters are here with Bard from the hospital. Thank you, Colonel. And they will not be admitted inside the gate, except at such time as a press conference is authorized. Well, this is some way to treat the American press. Sorry, ma'am. You don't look sorry. That Major Morgan was rude. We're only doing our job. That smug little jerk. He really enjoyed telling us to march. Certainly rude to me, I don't know. Well, they haven't heard the last of it. The freedom of the press is involved here. Only after if the general's private were paralyzed. And he turned and walked away from me. I call that rude. If I weren't a lady, I'd... She's sure gonna fool me. Yes, I've always liked Catherine Cornell. Extremely good actress. Saw her twice in the Ballads of Wimpole Street. Splendid performer. Mm. Last time I was in London, I saw uh, the Lunts in uh, There Shall Be No Night. Oh, yes. Well, that fellow Sherwood. Did you like it? Yes, very much. I hated it. <laughs> Would you close your eyes, please? Feel that? I think I feel something. Yes, I, yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Where? My chest on the right. Good. Right thoracic wall, patient localizes. No? I think so. Are you touching one of my legs? Tell the tendon, I'm sure. So, a hay mark is in the blackout. It was one nasty spot, hmm? Pitch dark and playgoers tumbling all over each other. I was there during World War I, too. Really? <laughs> Look up to the ceiling, would you please? Well, I think the hay market's pretty much the same as it was then, really. One respect, it hasn't changed at all. Oh, what's that? A chippy who was somewhat past her prime wanted to take me home. <laughs> there you go. And what was your response to this aged enchantress of the evening? <laughs> I told her, I'm sorry, Grandma, but you're just one more too late. <laughs> your prognosis? Uncertain, gentlemen. My examination confirms your diagnosis. Do you recommend any changes in our present treatment? Well, I should recommend forcing more fluids. Keep the room cool. I'm in favor of traction, of course, but I'd say increase to 10 pounds. And I'd dispense with the tongs and using these zygomatic hooks instead. Yeah, fish hooks under the cheekbones. It's painful. But you're right. It probably is necessary. I uh, 
have the queerest sensation in my hands. As if my skin and flesh were trying to fall off my bones. The strangest feeling. Like I was shedding my body. <laughs> Maybe I'm shuffling off this mortal coil, huh? In fact, it's, this sensation could be a good sign. Yeah. Dying has always intrigued me. The Hindu says it's the most exalted experience in life. Did you know that? No, I didn't. I'm not afraid. Only curious. So... Up he rose, and forth they went. Away from battleground, fortress tent, mountain, wilderness, field and farm. Death and the general, arm in arm. Well, Georgie? I'd say the greatest man in the world was your grandfather. You want to know why? Yes, sir. Because he died for his country, leading his troops into battle. He died at the head of brave men, and he carried a sword. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. One of the regrets of my life is that I'll never have the opportunity to die such a glorious death. No man can choose how he's born. And a man is lucky if he can choose the circumstances of his death. And by that choice, signify his life. He carried the sword? He was a brigadier general. And on that last cavalry charge, he rode a white horse. And he carried a sword. Georgie. It's good to see you, B. I've seen you in these scrapes before. You always come out all right. Stay at my place tonight, B. No, thanks, Jeff. I'd rather stay here. Perhaps at one of the rooms down the hall? Of course, we'll arrange that. Whatever you say. I'll be here all night long. Now, if there's anything you need or want, please don't hesitate. Just let me know. There are just a few things. No visitors. Agreed. Even if they claim to be family relations, not unless I clear it. Don't worry about that, B. And under no circumstances is General Beetle Smith to be admitted. Please understand, under no circumstances. I understand. Oh, this is a list of books I'd like to read to Georgie. We'll get right on it. Thank you for everything you're doing. I hope for the best. I'm prepared for the worst. I just want you to know you can't level with me.
tendon reflex is hyperactive in both lower extremities. A definite sweating in the C5 dermatome. Sounds like I'm one step away from an autopsy. Really, Jenna? That's not funny, George. I'm sorry, Lee. I apologize for getting you out of this wild goose chase, Colonel. I'm particularly sorry since it looks like you won't be able to spend Christmas with your family. Well, you know, with all the kids underfoot, I don't think anybody will have time to miss me. I don't believe that. You'll be missed all right. Well, at the moment, the general seems to be in fairly stable condition. He's holding up remarkably well. Barring unforeseen complications, I think he's out of danger, as far as saving his life is concerned. Gentlemen, I'm sure you realize that for all kinds of reasons, it's absolutely imperative that he survive. I don't care what it takes. Do whatever you can to keep him alive. Yes, what is it? <clears throat> All right, I'll tell him. Colonel, General Patton wants to see you. Alone. You doctors amaze me. How's that? Yeah. Repairing human wreckage the way you do. But I don't know if you'll be able to repair this wreck. Well... We'll give it a try. There's a hell of a lot at stake here. Of course. No, I don't mean just me. You see, I'm convinced that we'll be at war with Russia within five years. Maybe not the same kind of war as the last one. Not with this nuclear thing, no. I see things changing, but war, nevertheless. Those sons of bitches. They're going to push us hard. If there is war, I've got to be around to fight, to lead soldiers. That's all I can do, but I'm the best, you understand? Damn it, Colonel, I don't need to just live. I need to live to fight. I understand how you feel. So, uh, I want to know, I want you to tell me. What chance do I have to recover? You're doing so much better than the usual patient with a cervical cord injury. Well, it's just impossible to give you a forthright answer. After all, if, if the cord's been severed or severely damaged at the moment of impact, your chance to recover would be very slight. On the other hand, if, uh, if the cord was only slightly shaken up... Will I ever ride a horse again? No. The best I have to hope for is semi invalidism. Invalidism? General. Thank you, Colonel, for your honesty. I prize that in a man. Ladies and gentlemen, you care to follow me into the conference room? Come on, let's go. Have a quiet, please. Thank you. As you know, this conference is being held in lieu of the regular bulletin, usually given at 6 p.m. Sorry, man. This press interview is a major concession for the media, since we as doctors are essentially violating the sanctity of the physician and patient relations. And due to this fact, we may decline to answer those questions which we deem improper. I'd like to introduce Colonel Ben Sperling. Colonel Sperling has served throughout the war as the chief neurosurgical consultant in Europe. And most of you are familiar with 
Major Kenneth Morgan, our public relations officer. Yeah. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Paul Hill. I guess we can begin. Colonel, uh, Colonel, 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 what color pajamas does the general wear? An army his own or government issue? Government issue. Uh, Colonel, 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 I'd like to know if the general takes orange juice or grapefruit juice with his breakfast. Orange juice. Is he using much profanity in the hospital? And could you give us some examples? No, I couldn't. Which well, like of his nurses is his favorite? I believe he has no favorites. Does the general have a paralyzed... Madam, uh, please. Thank you. Dear Ruth Ellen, I'm in my little room at the hospital, directly down the hall from your father's. I spend most of each day with him, reading aloud from the books he has loved through the years. It helps to take his mind off the present situation, and it helps me too. This willful and resolute man, flamboyant and egotistical, had flirted with destiny and frequently seduced fate. Now his long pursuit was yielding its supreme reward. He was passing into history. He knows how worried I am, whether I show it or not. And he tries to calm my fears. After I meet him. He's always said that I knew what was best for him. I wish to God I did now. He's in the hands of others, strangers to me. I thought there were no more worlds to conquer at the age of 33. Wellington was 44 at Waterloo, while Napoleon and Hannibal were burned out by the time they were 40. All I can do is watch helplessly as they keep him occupied with myriad discomforting chores. Shouting at the top of his voice, attack you miserable cowards, what are you waiting for? You can't live forever. But we will ride out the storm together. He spared neither pain, care, nor trouble to arrive at his end. And this applied as much to little things as to great. He was, one might say, totally given over to his object. He always applied all his means, all his faculties, all his attention to the action or discussion of the moment. Thank you, Bertha. Into everything. Yes. You see, Colonel, Napoleon was a man completely wrapped in his own destiny, a supreme egotist isolated, self-centered man who relied on himself alone. Go, go ahead, B. Into everything he put passion, hence the enormous advantage he had over his adversaries. For few people are entirely absorbed by one thought, or one action, or one moment. <laughs> what a prophet he was. He said there would be no independence or liberty without great armies. And look what has happened to what was the greatest army in history. Just six months ago, the American army is being disbanded. <laughs> All right, Georgie, it's time to stop. You'll tire yourself out. You were supposed to listen. Joseph. <laughs> Just given him a mild sedative. Don't worry, he'll be all right now. Thank you, Colonel. Now I'll be right down the hole. Just go easy on the talking, huh? Yes, I will. It provokes the congestion. Mm. And if you behave yourself, we'll get you into a neck and shoulder cast. And we'll get rid of these hooks, okay? Good night, Mrs. Patton. Good night, Colonel. been at your best when the chips were tough. Shh. You heard what he said. How long has it been? How many years? You know, 35. 35. You put up with a lot for me, B. Any other woman would have left me a long time ago. I'm not any other woman. Oh, that's right, you're not. You've always 
always been the most important person to me. There is no one else. Georgie, you don't have to say anything. A mark of gentility. Sweetheart. So much of your life has been spent waiting. Jordi, do you remember when you landed in Africa? I can't describe my feelings when the news came over the radio that you had made your landing successfully. And that you had done exactly what you wanted to do. And I thought, this man is his own star. He commands all light, all influence, all fate. And I knew there'd be months Maybe years of waiting, anxiety ahead of me. And yet all I could think of was your trial. That the first jump was taken, that you'd never had to take it again. And I told myself, God is with us. He'll always be with us. And the thought that you loved me rang through my mind like a peal of bells. You loved me. As a youth, T.E. Lawrence thought nothing of reading half through the night, lying on a rug or mattress. A habit that had the convenience of allowing him to sleep where he lay. Exactly what I did at Lake Vineyard as a boy. <laughs> Just like Lawrence of Arabia. By habit, too, he developed the faculty. <laughs> He's all right. Well, that's enough for now, anyway. Did a fine job on the collar. Is he eating his porridge like a good bear, Lieutenant? No, but you're right about the bear part, Colonel. A man must eat, General. A man must eat, though every tree were a gallows. There he goes again, talking like that. Shame on you. This never end. Hang on, General. I'm so tired of just hanging on. I found this at the uh, P.S. Why not? Doctor's orders. We'll add it to your regular medication. You don't need one teaspoon when your condition calls for it. We better keep this between us, huh? You tell the girls. <laughs> Good. Let's all have a drink to the Medal of Honor I never got. And from now on, buddy, I make you my official bartender. <laughs> Lieutenant. Yes, sir. Uh, Lieutenant Hojaka has been detained in the lab. She asked if you check a reward for her. Oh, sure. I'll do it right now. All right. Thank you. Do you men know what time it is? Where's old Swivel Hips, Hodecker? She's been detained in the. Don't call her that. Hey, hey but... nursing. Want to dance? <laughs> Very funny. Now get into bed. All of you, or I'll sick Nurse Hodecker on See, Nurse, how's General Patton doing? Yeah. How is the old man? You're his nurse, aren't you? He's doing just fine. How are his spirits? Is he okay? Well, uh... Yeah, but he's a real colorful character, eh? Oh, he's colorful, all right. He won't take any nourishment now, unless he gets some whiskey first. Whiskey? That's right. What do you know? Flat on his back, those awful hooks and all. And, and still he... 
No, that's enough. Do you think you'll ever walk again? I said, that's enough. No more questions. Everybody turn in. And if you don't keep that radio off, I'll have Nurse Hodecker sit on it. Lieutenant. Good evening. Oh, Lieutenant Hodecker. The Great Whiskey Rebellion. <laughs> Poor Bertha. Don't be too hard on her. Then you don't mind. Yeah, it's good for my reputation. And besides, I can use all the laughs I can get. Oh, good. No harm, then. I'll drop by later. You comfortable? Okay. I don't suffer, my friends. But I do feel a certain difficulty in existing. Lucky pheasants running around because of the that man. Yeah. I, uh, I have something to read to you. Yes? Mm hmm It's a letter from Ike. Oh, God. Whatever you say. I don't want to hear it. Okay, go ahead. Dear George, you can imagine what a shock it was to me to hear of your serious accident. At first, I heard it on the basis of rumor and simply did not believe, thinking it only a story. I immediately wired Frankfurt and learned to my great distress that it was true. The real purpose of this note is simply to assure you that you will always have a job and not to worry about this accident closing out any of them for your selection. It is always difficult for me to express my true sentiments when I am deeply moved. You are never out of my thoughts and my hopes and prayers are tied up in your speedy recovery. With warm personal regards, All those years down the drain. What went wrong between us? Hap? Yeah. Where did you ever get the first name Hobart? I'll be seeing you soon. Hey, George. Yeah, come in. You looking for me? Yeah, we have a problem for him. What? Washington does not want General Patton to die on German soil. So we must prepare him for shipment back to the United States immediately. That's impossible. That's Washington. Even if Patton were out of danger, which he isn't, he shouldn't be moved for at least another six weeks. Mobilization of plaster cast leads to embolism. There must be some political benefit in having him die back home. What about all his soldiers who are buried in Germany? Wouldn't he want to be with them? Patton would. Why? Well, General, looks like you'll be home for Christmas. I'm looking forward to it. Doctor, even in this 
cement overcoat. Looks good, Bill. Thanks. I'll make good ballast. <laughs> yes, sir, that's for sure. Just don't uh, roll me down the hill. We wouldn't do that. Come in. I just thought I'd check up on you. Are you holding up? I guess so. Georgie's fooled everyone with his stamina and charm. All except Colonel Hill, I think he knows. Knows what? Georgie's slipping away. A little more each day. I can see it behind the bluff and bravado. Don't say that. There's something in the air. Something mysterious, like enchantment, or the miracle of birth. Don't you feel it? I wish to God transitions weren't so painful. Parting. We're all fated to part. Why should it seem so sad, melting into memory? Anyway, I don't believe death is the end. I think we come back again and again until we learn whatever it is we're meant to learn. Otherwise, this existence would seem so pointless. Georgie is an ancient man. And he'll be back. As long as the world needs a warrior soul. B. All these years I've had to be the hard-fisted, tough military wife. Facing every crisis like a soldier without emotion. But all the while, in here, I trembled for him. I'll see this through. I won't break. We're flying him to Boston before Christmas. I know. Is that wise? It's what he wants. It's what I want. It's been ten days since General George S. Patton met with that freak highway accident south of Frankfurt. Even with a broken neck, old blood and guts is apparently back in command loudly demanding an occasional snort of whiskey from his pretty nurses. Word from inside sources is that Patton is now sitting up in bed and will soon be walking. Good luck to you, General, from all of us. This is the voice of Uncle Sam in Germany. Sam Strausser. Fools. Hello, George. that you're going to take us home. Uh, 
How do I look? You look fine, George. Just fine. You always were a lousy liar. How's respiration? Erratic. It's that embolism I was afraid of. We can't make an aortic examination because of that cast. But you're telling me then. It's the beginning of the end. You told us to look with you. Oh, yes, I remember. How brave I was from a safe distance. You said there were new x-rays. Yes, this morning. And? There's an embolism in the upper right lung. We don't know where it came from. <laughs> We've prescribed digitalis, saline drip, protein. What is the matter with us? Why can't we let him go? The sun shines on us, darling. Start for us and call your popping. All the lights know, the lights down low. Let us know, let us know, let us know. When we finally kiss goodnight, I hate going out in the storm. Were you dreaming? I don't know. Something a long time ago, I think. Dreams are elusive. Catalina. What? My dream. With Catalina. Was I in it? You? Of course not. I don't believe you. I was there. And it was 1902, and you were a gangly boy, beanpole, and I was a tomboy. And we rode together all over that island. And before the summer was out, we had our understanding. How did you know my dream? That's exactly what it was. I was 15 then. I still played with dolls. I was a child. And she was a child. In this kingdom by the sea. But we loved. With a love that was more than love. Beatrice. Georgie. Georgie, you had two beautiful horses. 
Do you remember? And all the boys, they, they envied you so? Yeah. My father gave them to me. Yes. The black, I named Galahad. Mm -hmm. And the brown was Marmion. Marmion was such a fine horse. And what, what a beautiful heart. I had a dog named Polvo who slept in Marmion's stall. I remember one night going down to the stable when I was supposed to be studying and lying in the straw beside Polvo and looking up at Marmion and thinking, I must be the luckiest boy. You come back here. It's too dark. I mean, too late. Come in. B. Sperling and I are going over to the officer's mess for dinner. Why don't you come along? No, I should stay here. You've got to eat something. Come on. Georgie's fast asleep. Do you speak English? Yeah. We ask that you please remain on this floor only. No scuffling, no unnecessary conversations, and only 20 minutes tonight. We appreciate your coming. Everyone's been looking forward to it. <laughs> 